Uh, I remember this film in pieces. It's been so many years since uh, we've worked on it uh, that uh, I remember the telephone call. I think it must have been from you saying you'd like me to be in the film. And uh, I was flush from uh, success on Broadway and, and some major motion picture. And this was a small picture. This was uh, not a large budgeted picture. And the thinking is you don't do that sort of thing if uh, the promise of the of the big films are there. And I read the script, and uh, I think I may have told you in the intervening years, but you didn't know it then, that I would have paid you money <laughs> to do the part. <laughs> I wish you told me that. <laughs> right. No, I held it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was such a marvelous script from a wonderful book by Charlie Bo Charles Beaumont that uh, you had to do, one had to do this film. I believed in the picture very much. I had had a string of successes at that time. I had had something like 17 or 18 consecutive successes oh as gosh. the director. I had never had a failure. And every idea I gave to any production company was accepted. This was the first script. I paid uh, Chuck Beaumont for the book, and he wrote the script. And it was turned down by every company that had um, accepted all of my other pictures. For goodness sake. So sakes. my brother and I pooled our funds, and together with you, we made the picture. Yes, but when you say pool your funds, uh, now that we're starting to talk about this, I, I recall that you more than pooled your funds. You, you uh, took loans on your houses. Yes, we did, as a matter of fact. I got a second mortgage on my house. And, and uh, so there was a great deal personally at stake for you. Uh, not only financially, but emotionally. Emotionally, the picture turned out very well. It went to a number of film festivals, including the Venice Festival. I won a couple of awards as Best Director. You won more awards as Best Actor. The reviews were incredible. I still remember one review in the New York Times. It started off by saying, this motion picture is a major credit to the Im entire American film industry. Wow. It was the first film I ever made that lost money. I However, know. luckily, it didn't lose much. It just lost a little bit, so at least we didn't lose our houses. <laughs> right. That second mortgage has been paid off Indeed. Uh, by the 16 or 17 uh, successes that you had. Right? Um, the course is, I guess success is defined by if it makes if it makes a profit. Yes, uh, an economic success. An economic success. Uh, but this film uh, had a meaning and and a, and a sense to it that so many of of the films that I have made in the past and uh, before that and 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 after that did not have. And I presume the same applies to you. Yes, I believed very deeply in the subject, which was about racial integration in the South. I know you did, and I think everybody connected with the film, and that's one of the reasons why it's gone on to stay alive so many years. People remember it as an honest document for its time. You might say I'm in social work. I've come to do what I can for the town. The integration problem. Oh, that. But that's all over. I mean, they've got ten niggers enrolled already in the schools. And they're starting Monday. Yes, I know. Uh, do you think it's right? No. Well, I sure don't. Neither does nobody. But it's the law. Whose law? To me, as a Canadian uh, coming down to the United States, uh, I, I was not aware of uh, what was, what the turmoil was uh, in, 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 in terms of the conflict, black and white. It had no direct meaning to me, because in Canada, that, that didn't exist. So I was, I'm, I read the newspapers, and I would see the people, and I would see what was happening, but I didn't insightfully, intrinsically understand what was going on to get into and live in behind somebody who was being afflicted. I did not get into their heads until this picture, until The Intruder. And it was only in The Intruder did I, did I, was I forced to take a look at separate but equal and integration and feeling of, 
of, uh, of apartness because you're treated differently. You're an American citizen, but you're not. And I began to see what was taking place and the ferment that was also taking place in a desire to change all that. Uh, this picture was a, an epiphany for me uh, in working on it. It changed my life. Coming from California, I was aware of the uh, difference between the races, the uh, problems of segregation, but it was never as strong, obviously, in the North as is in the South. But it was there. There was still uh, a slight feeling of segregation, either even in a Western or Northern state. I had traveled a little bit in the South and was amazed that in my own country, this could be going on. Uh, we read about it, we experienced a little bit of it in California, but I remember the first time I was, I think, taking a bus somewhere in New Orleans, and I realized that all the blacks really were at the back of the bus. If you went to a theater, uh, the blacks were, I think, in the balcony, uh, and the whites could be downstairs in the preferential seats. And I realized that this was institutionalized. This was so built into their way of life that at least for a period of time, the whites accepted it as their natural right, and many blacks felt nothing could be done. And I think it was, although the great revolution was to come later in the 60s, it was already starting, I think, coming out of World War II when blacks and whites had fought equally or semi-equally in World War II and had come back to a society for which uh, blacks and Asian Americans, as a matter of fact, had fought and died for and had come back to find a society not equal and they determined to do something about it. Right. And, and, uh, and when you're not faced with it, if you're in your own little white community, and you don't see uh, the the trouble, uh, you tend to ignore it because uh, it's easier not to face it. It's when you're looking at it through the eyes of uh, somebody who's been segregated do you understand the forces at work or begin to understand. And it's interesting to me that Many people take the advances of the last 30, 40 years for granted. My sons are both basketball players, and they play on fully integrated basketball teams, and although we've not yet reached perfection, we've made great strides. Uh, I tell them a little bit about what it was like, and it's very hard for them to understand just in this short period of history we've come so far. Mm -hmm. Well, sir, you see, I represent the Patrick Henry Society. And what we'd like to know is just this, how you stand, whether you're for integration or against it. Well, that's a stupid question, young man. I'm a southerner. <laughs> sit down, sit down. Thank you. See, I was born and raised in these parts. <clears throat> so were my folks. That is, you're against it. Well, of course I'm against it. What's the matter with you? I don't remember exactly how I found the book, The Intruder, but as I recall, a friend of mine had read it and simply recommended it to me as a good book because he knew that I was very much interested in contemporary novels. And I read the book and contacted Chuck Bowman, and luckily he lived in Los Angeles. If he lived in uh, Albuquerque, he might never have made the film. That's funny. And I talked to him, and uh, we worked out an arrangement, and he wrote the script. And again, from inception, it was something that he believed in and I believed in. I remember the first time I saw you, uh, we had not met. You had done uh, Marlowe's play, Tamberland, uh, which I thought was brilliant. And I always remembered that performance. And uh, so when I came to cast uh, the picture, I had been told you'd come out to Hollywood. And I remember it was the simple thing at that point. I gave the script to your agent who gave it to you. We met, and uh, there it was. Yeah. That's interesting how one thing leads to another. I think another element that makes the picture live uh, in the way it does, it continues to live the way it does, is the emotions that are invested in the film, not only prior to, as we're talking now, writing the script and getting the locations, but in the actual filming. We, uh, it was not uh, without its danger. Yes. 
And that, I think, whether the audience realizes it or not, <clears throat> is reflected in some of the performances. I mean, there's genuine fear and terror on some locations where we were in jeopardy. Particularly the Ku Klux Klan um, drive through scene, which was the last scene we shot in the picture. And at the end of it, because as you remember, we were getting phone calls and threatening letters, we shot that scene after having checked out of our motel. And at the conclusion of it, we just stayed in the cars and kept driving to St. Louis. I remember that. And did you know, do you remember that there was an actual stabbing in the uh, uh, among the people lining the street? Somebody had been knifed. Yes, I do remember that. Yes. So the the danger was not uh, was not in our own minds. There were if I remember uh, there was a white gang, there was a black gang, both of whom were dangerous. But the most dangerous gang of all was a gang of ex-criminals who were black and white. Yes. So uh, the vicious criminal element did not uh, have its roots in black or white. They were just guys who wanted to get some money and, uh, and to uh, hurt somebody. I could almost make up some sort of a moral there. Crime knows no racial boundaries. But that's true. And in this case, it's, it's, it's evident. Um, there was a guy that um, I met, huge man, tough, and he was a source of irritant to the crew, I remember. He was uh, on the sidelines the whole time, and, and he was uh, railing at us and jeering at us. And he was a real enemy, and he was da considered dangerous by the by the police and by the uh, by the crew and uh, i re forget now exactly how i met him whether he was brought in as a crew member cuz he could take two stands i remember at, uh, do you have a recollection yes, of who I, i'm talking uh, about you know it does come back to me i think we did have him working because he was so strong he, because he was so strong and so potentially dangerous <clears throat> so i talked to him and i found out that he had a great quarter horse, and I was interested in horses, that he had his lucky chaps with which he'd won, I, I've forgotten, probably cutting competitions. And he had the fastest car in the uh, tri-state area. Of, and he had gone to Daytona with this uh, Pontiac, uh, this jazzed up Pontiac, and had won some stuff. And as I befriended him in the true manner of Southern generosity, he said, anytime you want to ride my horse, anytime you want to drive my car, I want you to do it. Well, it, we were somewhere, and Cairo, Illinois, was a little further away. And there was somebody there, I forgot now who I wanted to see and what it was I wanted to see. But I, one day I asked him, can I borrow your car? And he said, sure. He said, I want to show you a couple of things. Went to the trunk. And inside that, he opened the trunk, and inside the trunk were his la lucky chaps. He says, these are my lucky chaps. Uh, they brought me great luck in competition. I, they're right here. Don't, don't, don't do it. You know, just be sure that you, you don't open the trunk, because these are very important to me. Then he went to the, tr uh, the hood. Jack put the hood up, and he said, now, I want you to be careful. You can see there are no air cleaners here. That's because the raw air is sucked in through the carburetor, and and I've got uh, four carbs here, and it's the fastest car in the tri-state area. I won. This is my great car. This is a car. It's one of a kind. I love this car. I love this car very much. So now I want you to be careful because the open-mouthed carburetor allows gasoline to be thrown backwards as well. So every so often it catches fire. Now come over here, and behind the seat. He had an extinguisher, <laughs> and he said, here, if ever you smell smoke, trip the hood, get the hood off, and just all you have to do is extinguish the fire, and then it's fine. I do that all the time. So I said, okay, great. And I had the, had the fire extinguisher there, I had the hood there, and I had the trunk there, and I drive to Carroll, Illinois, and I'm parked doing something <clears throat> on the curb. I've forgotten, and somebody drives up alongside me and says, hey, uh, sir. 
your car's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so I rush to the trunk and then I see flames coming out of the trunk. And now I forget about the fire extinguisher. I need something to put this fire on. So I trip the hood and I trip the trunk and I run to the trunk and I grab some rags in the trunk and I start beating out the fire and I'm beating out the fire and I'm beating it out. And I finally, I get the fire out and the engine is melted. And I realized that the rags in my hands are his lucky chaps. <laughs> <laughs> and this is one of the most dangerous men uh, we've ever met. Uh, I had a t tough time telling him I had a What did he do? Him. What did he do when you, you told him? I think he killed me. Yeah, yes. And right. we made a movie of that. I remember because <laughs> you looked a little different in the later scenes. <laughs> That's right. we, got, we, <laughs> we, had to, we had to resurrect me. It was, uh, I think he was gracious about it, actually. I think he said, oh, I, I know. Uh, Something about it, but it was it was dire and wonderful at the same time. Now he told me a very similar story, but he said, "You know, I'm getting a little tired of this car, and I've got it heavily insured, and I've got this <laughs> idiot that I'm going to get to take the car." <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but I remember some other tough uh, scenes. Do you remember the end of the picture where you? Uh, and Leo Gordon and Charlie Barnes, the local uh, black kid we had uh, playing uh, uh, the young guy in the, in the student. Uh, which reminds me of the fact we only had four or five professional actors. I think it was you, Leo Gordon, uh, Gene Bernson, and one other. And all the rest of them were local people. And uh, anyway, in the final scene, where, which takes place outside the school, and uh, Charlie is being swung back and forth in the swing. That was one of the roughest things we ever had. We shot it in two days, and the first day, everything was fine. We got all our long shots, all our establishing shots, and when we went back for the second and concluding day, and this was the climax of the picture, the sheriff of East Prairie, Missouri, uh, stopped us at the borders of the town and said, you can't come into the town. We had nothing else to do, and I remembered, no place to shoot, and I remembered that there were some swings in the public park in Sykeston. So we drove back to the public park, and we shot during the morning, uh, shooting in tight, uh, so you wouldn't see the, uh, the school, on the public park swings, and the police of Sykeston came by to throw us out, and you and I were working on the set, and my brother was doing a greater, not a greater, an equal job of acting, talking to the police, because he knew I needed a little time to finish the scene, and saying, well, I don't understand, officers. Can you explain exactly what your <laughs> attitude is? Just double talking. We kept shooting until it was time to break for lunch, and I gave the sign to my brother, and my brother said, okay. Uh, we'll understand. We understand. We'll leave. Uh, we'll leave town. We Gene, Gene uh, your brother Gene, has not changed at all. He double talks no matter what. <laughs> right, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> and uh, we still had half a day of shooting to do. And during lunch, while everybody was breaking for lunch, I had remembered another school that we had scouted and rejected because it was out in the country. And I drove to that school and. Uh, it was summer vacation, and there was nobody there. So we went to the school without any permits or anything. We didn't fool around with that sort of thing. <laughs> and we shot the uh, concluding part of the scene on the swings there. And nobody has ever noticed the fact that the final scene was shot in three different locations, and the swings were of different heights. And it scene plays, and I think it's partially the way we shot it, and partially your performance was so strong, they were looking at you. This town I'm talking about, Caxton! Yeah! People, something happened today. Ten Negroes went into the Caxton High School and sat with the white children there. No. Nobody stopped them. Nobody turned them out. And you know what they're saying that means? They're saying that you all don't give a darn whether the whites mix with the blacks because you didn't fight against it. The, um, the denouement of that film was uh, also uh, vivid, it still vividly lives in my mind. Um, you had chosen as a location a, a uh, courthouse the exterior of a courthouse uh, and steps that went up and and now the character I was playing was about to 
harangue the mob to rise up and and pillage um, so that uh, integration would not take place. And uh, uh, for several days before that final scene, uh, which was, I believe, at the end of the week, we had done a lot of yelling and jumping and screaming and running, both from the police, from the gangs, and uh, and also on camera. My voice was, was shot, and I had the day before off. So if it was a Friday night that we were going to shoot, I had Thursday night off, and I'd gone to the doctor in the local town who said, you've got laryngitis, which is fatigue, uh, an overuse of the muscle of the voice, you need to rest. And you may be able to speak. I could, I could not speak. I was talking like that. And I had this long several pages of speech to make. So I said, can you give me some sleeping pills? I don't work tomorrow night. Can you give me some sleeping pills and put me to sleep for 24 hours, which is what I did. I took sleeping pills. And actually, I remember waking up and thinking it was 12 hours later, but it was only a couple of hours later. So I popped a couple more. And, and finally, I had drugged myself out to be out of it for 24 hours, during which, if I had to speak, like get something to eat, I wrote it out. I never used my voice. And I didn't use my voice when we went to location. I did not speak. I wrote out the notes. And you set up over my shoulder onto the crowd first and then when you finished all your coverage facing away from me or, or, or over my back onto the crowd and I didn't speak to the crowd even on their reactions you had it read by somebody either yourself or people I had it read but what we wrote was not totally innocuous what you were, what that's you exactly said. right you <laughs> wrote innocuous things that's right it was you know buy at uh, Saks you know <laughs> Macy's window or whatever drink uh, Perry and uh, I think I've got enough uh, product placement in there yes um, and work with Priceline and work yeah, with Priceline line. and buy your tickets of course uh, and all of which was meaningless to the audience and then you reversed and you went way away from me I still didn't speak and finally you were on me for the medium and close shots. By that time, it was after midnight, and the crowd realized the truth that everybody who's not connected with a movie ultimately realizes. That is, making a movie, like watching a horse show, is boring unless you're intimately connected with the details of, of what it is you're doing. So they had long since left. There were ten people left in the, out of the hundreds that had turned up. And I began my speech and spoke the speech for the first time with great gratitude that my voice was working, but nobody was there. And the following day, I think it was you and I, were walking along the main street, and the guy from the newspaper called us over. And he said, do you realize that where you were last night, that tree that was uh, in the courtyard was a tree that was used for lynching, that people in the audience that you had last night would have remembered uh, the the." Terrible, tragic events that that uh, that uh, took place there, and that had I spoken these fiery words that uh, Charles Beaumont had written, they might uh, we might have had a different ending on our hands. A very fast ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I do remember that, and I remember also the fact that people did not totally know exactly the details of what you were doing. The script we gave, uh, handed out, was a little bit different than the script we actually shot. Mm -hmm. And I remember you had a group of followers that I had chosen, or they were sort of the guys who sat around the town square whittling and spitting and talking. And they had great faces. And they were your loyal followers. And while you were saying these various inflammatory, uh, anti-integrationist uh, sentiments. They were yelling and applauding. They were with you all the way, and they thought you were a good guy. And they were really disappointed when they found out at the end of the picture that you were a bad guy. They agreed with you all the way. <laughs> and that the school's integrated. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you mean that's the way it ends? And I'm willing to give my life, if that be necessary, to see that my country stays free White and American! Yeah. 
so making the film uh, was a, a, a risk to you as a, uh, personally, financially, and, and I, I'm sure artistically. Uh, and to you and the rest of us, it was a risk uh, physically uh, to make the film. There was a lot at stake. There was a lot at stake, and uh, although it was not at that time a commercial success, eventually, because it's hung on so long, it has finally broken <laughs> the black. But emotionally, I still remember it uh, as one of the best pictures or one of the films I remember most fondly and I'm most proud of. And I think your performance was brilliant. The number of awards you won with that performance was well, amazing. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful opportunity. The Intruder was named several things as it went through its... It, was, it started as The Intruder, and it was not a commercial success. So uh, a sort of an exploitation distributor from the South that I knew said he could make this picture uh, commercially successful. Uh, and I said, fine, and he put some wild title on it, and it did a little bit better, but I, I really remember what the title was. I have blocked it out of my mind. The Garbage Man. I yes, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and uh, it's gone back to being the intruder, and it's had a very strange um, life and keeps going. For instance, the British Film Institute uh, asked me if they could release it. I was not aware that they did this in England uh, as part of some sort of a series of socially committed films. Wow. This was two years ago, and it was a big success in England, and of the films in that series that they put in a series of art theaters, it was the highest grossing uh, For goodness picture, sake. and it got wonderful reviews. So, the, And I think what it is, and I've always believed this, if the people making the film, the writer, director, producer, actors, even the crew and so forth, really believe in a film and make it honestly and truthfully, the film itself is permeated with that. I agree. Uh, but I think it, uh, as they say of a fish, in this case, uh, the, the vehicle, uh, the, 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 the cinematic vehicle, is being led by the head. The the fish stinks at the head. I think it was the the uh, the uh, the film is led by the director, and the passions and the and the uh, first force of creativity is the director's. And it was you, Roger, that uh, took us uh, there. And it was your your courage and your your commitment to your picture, and uh, and one doesn't, that doesn't come to mind uh, when you think of a Roger Corman film, you think of a Roger Corman film, you think of the wonderful talents that were started, that you, you spotted early on, that you made for a price, you taught a lot of people in this industry to make films clean and, uh, and with no fat on them at all, uh, and, and put every penny that you spend, put it up on the screen and not in uh, uh, craft service table. Uh, it's a lesson I learned uh, and am applying even as we speak. You're directing a film now. I'm directing a film now and I'm searching for, it's not a controversial film, but it's difficult to make a film cheaply anymore. Uh, people have gotten sophisticated about asking for money for locations and and for performing performing as I'm it's all it, it's quite different and yet it's not because the need if you have a limited amount of money and you want to make a film the need to put the money on the screen is the same yes and uh, you laid down some fine groundwork there that we're all still trying to follow what I've always believed is what ultimately counts is what is on the screen, not how many people, as you say, the craft service table, although you can have pretty good food on the craft service table, not what's behind the camera, ultimately what is there. And uh, I think on The Intruder, the fact that we shot it on the actual locations with primarily non-actors who possibly their lack of ability showed, but the realism of what they did showed. And talking about costs and so forth, I remember we shot it in three weeks on a budget of around seventy or eighty thousand dollars, which was would be impossible today, but was pretty tough then. And uh, I think back of it, uh, back on it as uh, 
a kind of a milestone for me and uh, a brilliant performance for you. Uh, we've both gone on. We've had good careers. You've had a great career. And I think we can look back at this film with pride. And I do.